Good morning. The title of the message is Jesus Changes Water into Wine. Uh, Key verse, uh, chapter, chapter 2, verse 11. What Jesus did here in Canaan and Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. And his disciples believed on him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Come to you in the name of Jesus. I pray that we may uh, experience Jesus' life-changing power. No matter what stage of life we are in, Jesus' power and transform, Jesus' transforming power is available to us. Lord, help us to learn the secret to experiencing the life-changing power so that we can become blessed servants of God, full of obedience and useful to God, so that we may experience the glory of God and the presence of God in our lives on a daily basis. O oh Lord, I praise your name and give thanks, O oh Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we've been studying uh, Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, where God created the heavens and the earth. In six days, and he rested on the seventh. God created man, Adam, and then Eve, and placed them in the garden. Adam was supposed to be a steward of the garden and take care of this beautiful garden that God created for him. Eve was supposed to raise up the nation of humanity in order to subdue the earth and bring everything in conformance to God's garden. And the earth was supposed to be the garden of God. And man was the ruler and take care, take, uh, and steward of the earth. This was a great, this was the will of God for mankind. However, Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the will of God was lost. And the garden was lost. And they were subsequently kicked out of the garden. This is sad. This was a sad turn of events. The joy of the garden was gone. And Adam and Eve hid themselves from God and became and blamed each other And life became very cold and dark. This is a very tragic, uh, this was very tragic. And this happened to not only Adam and Eve, but all of their descendants. This happens to you and me as we get kicked out of the garden and we are left to to toil under the the ground of our lives until we uh, until we until we go to the dust of the earth 
or we receive the pain of childbearing and we raise up children with zeal and passion just to see them leave the house and and we become empty nesters and there's a sense of loss because that because those we have loved so much invested our lives in are gone and we are lonely when we study this chapter there are many many things we can learn this chapter is this passage is one of my favorite passages it's only 11 passages 11 verses but there's so many truths of God's word that we can learn from the, this 11 passages However, in this message, we're going to focus on one thing. We're going to focus on Jesus' life-transforming power. Because we need to focus on Jesus' life-transforming power. Jesus... Jesus was changing water into wine tells us the nature of his messianic ministry. Jesus can transform people, those lives from um, meaningless people to people full of God's vision and joy. People who are useful to God and a blessing to others. Many people are not satisfied with their lives and think negatively about themselves. This is a sad uh, commentary on humanity, but I know this is true because I, because this sentence belongs to me. I became unsatisfied with myself and spoke many negative words about and against myself and my soul. It is because we repeat many bad habits. We know that we should change and improve, but we kind of fall back to the reset. We try to change, but we, like many computers, just fall to our default settings, things that are most comfortable to us. We try... um, We try different diets. We We try to change our lives in many different ways. We may struggle and and toil for a week or two or three, but then we get tired and we just want to go back to what's easy for us, to what's comfortable for us. But this doesn't make us happy. This just makes us more discouraged because we're because we were already unhappy in the first place. Some people really want to be hardworking and diligent. But inevitably we fall into laziness. Can we be really changed? Yes. No matter how old we are, no matter who we are, whether we have just gra- or whether we are in middle school, high school, graduated high school, in college, graduated college, 
in our work, uh, middle, middle, midlife, whether we are in our midlife crisis, whether we are in our later years, God's changing power is available to us. Nothing is impossible with God. God can change us here and now. All things are possible with God. Let's say this together. We need a lot of practice. All right. All things are possible with God. All right. I'm not quite convinced yet, but maybe we'll work on that and the at the end of the message that we'll be we'll be better. All right. <laughs> All things will be possible with God. First, it was the third day. And Jesus was met. And Jesus met with his disciples, and they were in a wedding that took place in Canaan and Galilee. For the people of this region, this was the most joyful time. Joyful occasion. You know, what was Galilee known for? Who, what? What was Galilee known for? It was known for being the land of the shadow of death. How would you like to live in the land of the shadow of death? Galilee was not a happy place to live. You could go out of your home, you could step out of your house, and you could very easily not come back. Every day was not promised to you. It was the land of the shadow of death. It was like living in Syria today, or Afghanistan. Not a safe place to live. So that made weddings so much more important. Weddings were a time when people could receive joy and thanksgiving. Everybody loves a wedding, right? Everybody wants to go and be filled with the joy and, and, and the grace of, of the bride and groom. Starting new lives together. This was a chance for Jesus and his hungry disciples to to eat as much as they wanted. However, there was a problem. The wine of the wedding had run out. This was a serious problem. Because in this passage, the wine represents joy. And no one wants joy to run out of the wedding, right? The wine provided a joy. And we know that if you if you, the joy runs out of your wedding, this is a very tragic thing for the people who put on the wedding. It's a tragic tragedy for the bride and groom because they are the, they are the people who are remembered for the, oh, you're the wedding, you're the people who the, the, the wine ran out, the joy ran out of your wedding. That's what I remember about your wedding. There was no wine at your wedding. This was a serious problem, and Mary, Ma, and Mary, Jesus' mother, was there to take care of it. Mary had been living with Jesus for 30 years, and she knew how to bring her problems to Jesus. And this 
situation was no different. Jesus brought, or Mary brought her problems to Jesus. She brought the problem that there was no wine. The servants were in, this was a servant problem. The servants didn't mix the wine properly. They didn't use the water properly to, 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 in order to make the wine last the entire, entire week. The servants were desperate. And they didn't want to tell the master of the bank that there was no wine. Instead, they, took, they came to Mary. And they told Mary about this problem. And Mary, in turn, brought this problem to Jesus. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, Woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. Yet, the, here, the word woman is not rude, but it's a, a polite matter, a polite, a polite way of addressing a woman. Jesus spoke to her as the Messiah not as the son or our mother. The words here, the hour has not yet come, introduces the theme of Jesus' climax of his death and crucifixion of his life. This was God's appointed time. Jesus knew that his life was in, in God's hands. And everything was conducted according to God's appointed time. <clears throat> Jesus lived a life of obedience. First he obeyed his parents, and then he obeyed God. Waiting on God is does not mean sitting down and doing nothing. Verse 5 says, His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Mary used her influence to create an environment in which Jesus could work. She understood that Jesus works through those who obey him. God used obedient people, not, not rebellious people. Through Mary's good influence, the servants fully trusted Jesus and were really ready to do whatever he told them. Especially preparing environment for Jesus. His work is very important. Let's see how Jesus responded to Mary's request. Jesus went right to work. Nearby, there were six stone water jars, the kind used for uh, Jews for ceremonial washing. In total, there were a total of 120 to 180 gallons of water, equivalent to 60 large buckets. Jesus said to the servants, fill the, the jars of water. This task seemed unrelated to the problem at hand. They needed wine, not water. And this was a tough, this was a tough, this was not an easy uh, demand that Jesus said. Because the well was all the way down in the valley. And the house would be on the, this would be a mountainous area. So the house would be on the top or on the side of the mountain. And the servants had to go all the way into the valley and bring the water all the way up to the house. 
This was not an easy, easy command. The servants had to work hard to obey Jesus' command. But the servants, fearful of, the, of going to the master of the bank, banquet without, without wine, obeyed with zeal and passion. They filled the jars to the brim. This indicates that they obeyed wholeheartedly and willingly. They did not feel burdened by Jesus' command because they trusted Jesus. Then Jesus told them, draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. These words changed the servant to, <coughs> challenged the servants to trust Jesus even on a more and higher level. It was one thing to work hard, to, to, to conduct a simple task of filling jars with water. But it's a whole other thing was to take some of this water, which they knew to be water, and bring it to the master of the banquet as if it was the wine of life. But they did so. The days, in these days, obedience is very unpopular, especially with young people. Those who obey are characterized as weak and foolish and kind of naive. While those who are, have rebellious spirits seem cool and strong, and many young people intentionally try to live rebellious lives. They think that they think that if they obey someone, they will lose their own identity and individuality. But the Bible teaches us that obedience is very important. Those who obey God are truly wise and courageous people and most blessed. For example, when Noah was warned that the flood of judgment was coming and he commanded to build, was commanded to build an ark, he obeyed in holy fear. The people around him thought that he looked foolish for building such an ark on the side of a mountain where there was no water. But they, look, they were the foolish ones. When the waters, when the rain started to pour out from the heavens and the flood waters came and Noah was safely, Noah was safely, Noah and his family were safely in the ark. Noah preserved his family and thus the human race from God's judgment. Obedience of servants in this passage reflects the obedience of Jesus himself. <laughs> Jesus' life is characterized by obedience. In this early years, he obeyed his parents and then his Father in heaven. Jesus' cross was the cross of obedience. Obedience does not come naturally, but we must learn obedience. Hebrews 5, 8, and 9 say, The son through his um, son, though, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. As disciples of Jesus, we too must learn to and teach obedience. Jesus said, teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. Without learning obedience, we cannot experience God's blessing. So let's learn obedience. 
We must learn the secret to obedience. Because there are many pitfalls and traps out there for people who desire to obey but are really not wholeheartedly who do not really wholeheartedly want to obey. But the servants obeyed. The master of the banquet tasted the water and had it been and that had been turned into wine. And he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everybody brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests had had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. This tells us that the wine that Jesus made was the best. Because of the because of the wine because of this wine the joy of the wedding banquet increased all the more. But the joy of the guests was only temporary. For they did not know where the wine had come from. On the other hand, the servants who had drawn the wine knew where it came from. They experienced Jesus himself. They experienced Jesus as the fountain of joy. They learned the secret of drawing the joy from Jesus through trusting and obeying. Third, Jesus and his disciples. Apparently, while Jesus changed water into wine, the disciples did not do anything, in contrast to Mary and the servants. But John clearly tells us that the first sign had a great impact on them. Verse 11 says, what Jesus did here in Canaan and Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. And his disciples believed on him. Here we find that Jesus' purpose in turn water into wine at the wedding was to reveal himself as the Messiah, especially to the disciples. He learned, he wanted them to know who that he was the Son of God, who was powerful to work miracles. He changed the very nature of the substance immediately by the act of the will. Through him, everything is possible, even the transforming of people into new creations. Jesus emphasized the disciples believed in him, this does not indicate the theological knowledge, but faith that Jesus change could change each of them into new people. For example, Jesus had told Peter, you will be called Cephas. It meant that he would be changed from an ordinary fisherman into an inf influential man of God, of human history. Jesus revealed his glory to his disciples in order to help them to grow in trust in him and commit their lives to him. Like a tree putting down deep roots and growing and bearing much fruit. Like this, like his disciples, they also, we also need to believe that Jesus is the Messiah who can change us from useless people into useful people commit and commit our lives to him. The problem is that even though we know Jesus was, has changing power, we may not experience it practically in the way we expect. We want to change our bad habits or character flaws we try, but they are stronger than we expect. Sometimes we give up, thinking, I will never change. Even Jesus cannot change me. 
This negative thinking, which comes from unbelief, hinders Jesus' power and working in our lives. Jesus wants us to remove this unbelief, which may be deeply rooted in our hearts. For example, in John 11, Mary confessed that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. But when he told her to remove the stone from the Lazarus tomb, she, re- reluctant, she re- rejected strongly in unbelief. She knew who Jesus was in her head, but did not have faith in her heart to remove the stone of unbelief. Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? Jesus wants us to believe in him from our hearts. This may require us to repent of our unbelief. Lord, I believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. And Jesus came to work powerfully to change us. Jesus' power does not merely improve our condition, but it changes us fundamentally. Changing water into wine is changing the very nature of the substance. In the same way, Jesus changes a person. He transforms the substance of our natures from sinful, vile human beings into useful people who are full of God's grace and love for others. People who can love God and love our flawed neighbors. Jesus can overcome us. Jesus is the answer to our frustration. Jesus' transforming power can change even the vilest man or woman into a woman, a man or woman who loves God with all their heart. Paul said, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Even though Jesus has tra- transfor- uh, even though Jesus has transforming power, it does not work automatically in all people. It works only in those who trust him and commit their lives to him. Mary trusted Jesus in prayer. The servants trusted Jesus in obedience. The disciples trusted Jesus in response to his changing power. They all experienced the power of God through Jesus. They trusted him. When we learn trust in Jesus, then we can learn the trust in one another. We can experience Jesus' life-transforming power in our own lives. We can get rid of that unbelief from years of making bad mistakes and, and, uh, and unfortunate circumstances. We can live in the power of Jesus, no matter how old we are or young we are. When we trust in Jesus, the, world, the spiritual world of God is open to us. It is available to us. We have the power to experience Jesus' life-transforming power and become obedient people to God and useful people to God's will on this earth. Jesus loves us and he wants us to be happy. He doesn't want us to make the same old mistakes over and over again. So, 
Is all things possible with God? What do you think? All things are possible with God. For him who believes. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that we may, no matter how old we are or young we are, we may experience the life-transforming power in the, of, in the, through Jesus' example of changing water into wine through this message, O oh Lord. I pray that we may not be a men and women of excuses and unbelief, but we may be filled with the trust in Jesus, like Mary, the servants, and the disciples. Oh Lord, and we may go out to the masters of the banquets and the bridegrooms of life and proclaim the good news of Jesus' first uh, messianic miracle. I praise your name and give thanks. Pray in Jesus' name.